I've actually never been to Ireland. It was Iceland, but it's hard to read <laughs> from the party. I'd like to go to Ireland. Um, so we can play that video, Nicole. So this is a wolverine that is only like 10 miles from where I live in Twisp. And you would think that I would have caught this as a field biologist, but it was just out on a ski tour. <laughs> and we came across a, uh, a moose carcass that was taken down by a pack of wolves. So because I have access to game cameras, we put a game cam up and sure enough, Gulo Gulo arrived and chowed down. Um, okay, so yeah, Scott mentioned that I work as a guide and I also work as a field biologist. I have a particular fondness for remote, snowy, rugged terrain like many of us do, um, but monitoring wolverines has really connected me to the mountains in a much deeper way. And so I hope to convey that to everybody because we represent kind of like a high-powered lens on wolverine habitat as backcountry skiers. And so if we can leverage those skills, then we can have more eyes on uh, the gulo gulo. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about the gulo gulo. That's the scientific name, if you didn't know, the gluttonous glutton. Um, <laughs> So we'll do a little Gulo Gulo 101 for you, and then I'll talk about the population in the North Cascades and uh, the current research and how you can get involved. So I'm not gonna use a clicker because it doesn't seem like it's, hey, Nicole, Psh. can we go to the ne next one? Okay, so um, Gulo Gulo inhabits the circumboreal region of the planet. We are a tiny little lobe, not the big red lobe, the red is, circumboreal region. So we're not the Rockies, of course, but we're that tiny little lobe <laughs> that's sticking down uh, from the north. Uh, the Cascades represent the southernmost extent of viable habitat for wolverine. And within the Pacific Northwest, their habitat is further constrained. Uh, wolverine are bound to cold, snowy habitat. They require snow, persistent spring snowpack well into May, to the middle of May, in order to reproduce young. So this map shows um, where persistent spring snowpack exists, and that is wolverine habitat. Let's go to the next slide. So to put in perspective how rare these mountain carnivores are, we have 7.3 million people in Washington State, <laughs> shockingly. 100,000 coyote, 25,000 black bear, 2,200 cougar, and then we get to the really rare ones. So that's wolves, lynx, grizzly, and gulo gulo, which is 30 to 40 individuals that we estimate um, in the North Cascade. So that's like north of I-90, there might actually be more, but we don't have uh, monitoring throughout the range here. Okay, let's go to the next one. Backcountry skiers happen to come across wolverine more than field biologists do. <laughs> so um, I know it's hard to discern if this is a juvenile Yeti track or if this is wolverine. So I'm gonna help you figure out when you are out skiing as uh, Forrest and Trevor did from Snoqualmie Pass to the Canadian border. So the next time you do that and you come across these tracks, um, you have to know a little something about weasel tracks. So wolverines are the largest terrestrial weasel. And let's go to the next slide. They have a star-shaped pattern. So like their entire foot uh, registers, like, we, like ours do, were plantigrade, like bears. So their heel and their palm and their all five toes register and most of, their, most of the time their claws do too. So the weasel pattern is like a star shape that comes out of the palm. And compared to their gait, or I should say compared to their stride, their feet are huge because they, like skiers, they wanna float. So that tells you something about who, what animal those tracks belong to. Let's go to the next one. This is a picture that um, my husband took on Big Jim Mountain, east of Stevens Pass. And these are two wolverines side by side, walking and sliding. I don't have a picture of their slides, but they often play in the snow 
they slide and run, etc. Um, this picture is, if you've read Doug Chadwick's book, The Wolverine Way, then you know what the one two, one lope is. And this is the one two, one lope. So this is the gate that a wolverine uses to travel massive distances. It's booking it. And the one two, one refers to one print. The second print is actually another print registering on top of the first. And then one more, so one, two, one. Okay. So how do you track an animal that is so, such a low density species across a huge habitat? You go out and build burly traps. <laughs> Actually, this, so it, it's, a, it's a feat. <laughs> um, there has been a North Cascades Wolverine project um, for 10 years, it concluded a few years ago, and a dozen or more of these traps were built on site, mostly out of the Methow Valley. So this is the first scientific monitoring for Wolverine in the Cascades. Let's go to the next one. And it requires a lot of maintenance, so like twice a week you gotta go out and check the traps, and then the trap door shuts, you gotta go out and find out who's in there. Let's go to the next one. And then if you do have a wolverine trap, then you need to sedate them, take measurements, take pictures of their unique chest blazes, which are kind of like fingerprints, to identify individuals. Um, and most people would be surprised how cute and cuddly they are. <laughs> They're not, I'm, I'm totally kidding. Um, so, Fully sedated Rocky here is outfitted with his bling, which is a VHF and satellite collar. And then you can track the movements of that individual wolverine. So, so the gray line is our Canadian border. And then you can see the green perimeter that's North Cascades National Park. And then each polygon is one individual wolverine's activity area. So, Red, in this case, is female. Blue is male. Can you kind of, I hope you can see this on the screen, but they have huge activity areas. So, you know, 100 square miles for a female, probably 250 square miles for a male. I mean, it's enormous. It's super impressive. Let's go to the next one. Okay, so the 10-year live trapping program um, was completed in 2014. And then we evolved the monitoring project to become what we call non-invasive. Good thing for the Wolverine. Um, let's go to the next one. So that meant setting up uh, camera stations um, throughout the same study area and baiting them with scent lure and p pieces of like, carcass um, and putting up cameras that were remotely triggered and then retrieving those cameras. A lot of fun walking around with carnivore scent lure in your pack <laughs> in the mountains. <laughs> and then if you go to sleep, you're like, ooh, what's gonna happen? <laughs> um, so we had a lot of unintended visitors, um, which is fun, um, but some of those visitors were bare in the summertime and they would destroy our stations. So we had pretty low success. You could call it failure for the first few years. Um, <laughs> So we decided to uh, join up with a Microsoft engineer who figured out how to dispense scent lure, build a little chip, dispense scent lure throughout the winter on a very low voltage setup. So we'd climb trees above where the maximum snow depth would happen, and then we'd leave. And the bear would come and they would climb the trees <laughs> and check things out, <laughs> um, and sometimes destroy the stations. But for the most part, we had excellent success. We had, in the first winter, I think identified seven individuals. In all 10 years of live trapping, only 13 individuals were identified, trapped, collared. So, so this is very promising. Let's go to the next one. Um, this is a really blurry picture <laughs> of a camera that was tree bombed, so that's why it's crooked. Um, and a lot of the cameras were messed up to some degree but we, we still got good data. So this winter, there's a lull. We don't quite have funding to start a real monitoring effort with the protocol that we've developed over the last four years. Um, but I'm motivated <laughs> to, 
<laughs> to go out there still. So um, in the Met How, a good friend, uh, wildlife photographer and educator, David Moskowitz, has agreed to donate his fancy digital SLR cameras. Now I have agreed to go set up the stations. And we are going to attempt to put out stations to capture high resolution, which we haven't done yet, and beautiful images, hopefully, knock on wood, of Wolverine in the Cascades, which we don't have. So um, that's what's happening this winter. Um, I need some money, so if anyone's interested, <laughs> not much, <laughs> it's not much. A lot of this is volunteer and donation. Um, but uh, please contact me. Um, we, we're, we're in conversation with a fiscal sponsor, but I couldn't confirm it by today, so disregard what Scott said earlier about Conservation Northwest, but if you do talk to them, <laughs> tell them to be our fiscal sponsor. Um, but in the big picture, we can all do something for the Wolverine outside of just this winter. Um, one thing is to learn to identify track and sign so that you can tell your friends about it. We can keep Wolverine in the forefront of our minds um, as our spirit animal of the Alpine. Um, and then report those observations to wildlife agencies. So that could be the Forest Service. You could go to Conservation Northwest, which has a robust citizen science monitoring program. You could also go to the Wolverine Foundation website. They're based out of Idaho, but they'll collect Wolverine sightings from all across North America. Um, and then if you're really motivated, oh yeah, and donate to monitoring efforts, that's a big one. <laughs> and then if you're really motivated, become a citizen scientist. So you can adopt a Wolverine camera station yourself and go out there and check it. We just removed a station that was put up two years ago. We didn't have anybody to go out and, and keep track of it over those two years. So um, we need more people who are interested in helping out the Gulo Gulo. So don't hesitate. Um, and we'll go to that next slide, Nicole, thank you. And so, yeah, if you want more information, you can contact Conservation Northwest, Woodland Park Zoos, Field Conservation Program, the Wolverine Foundation. And um, just to kind of close it out here, you know, if you're not convinced that Wolverine are just worth paying attention to, just consider that right now, the climate and biodiversity are our biggest concerns, in, in my opinion, many people's opinion. So if we have access to keep track of an animal that inspires us, then like, go for it. <laughs> Actually pay attention to this animal. Every species matters, especially in low resource environments, low density populations like the wolverine. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna borrow a phrase from Ski Patrol. Because I patrolled, that was an important part of my history, decade of pro patrol at Stevens which is awesome, um, <laughs> uh, and, and let's think about the Wolverine and keep eyes on. Thank you very much, and I, I can take some questions if you have them. Yeah, we've got a question back there. Um, I heard a little bit about some of the monitoring out in Idaho when I lived there, and. Uh, that maybe some of the skier interaction with Wolverine had a bigger impact than even sledder, snowmobiler impact. Are you able to speak to that or do you know? So I can't specifically speak to it. I did meet uh, some of the field crew in Idaho uh, who are working on that project. And it was in part sponsored by the Snowmobilers Association, which is really interesting. Um, so I don't think we have enough information uh, to say one way or another. And it could just be my ignorance of the conclusions from that study. Uh, certainly, we do need to be aware that our presence in Wolverine habitat affects Wolverine. And so we go into a future of higher human presence in remote areas. Let's keep it in mind and let's fund Wolverine research so that we can find out. Um, we were just having a discussion about um, machines versus uh, skiers, people on the landscape and how animals respond to that. So it's a really interesting research question and I know there have been studies where you bring a helicopter or an ATV and you bring it into wildlife habitat versus a birder <laughs> or someone walking around on the landscape and some animals respond with more vigilance and more flight from the predator on foot than from the motorized vehicle, which is not what you would think. 
But, I, but with Wolverine, I don't know. Do we have any other questions for Steph? Check. Do you have any information on like how the Wolverine population has changed over time and what would be like, is 30 to 40 in the Cascades a healthy population or is that like on the edge of? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we hunted, trapped and poisoned Wolverine out of the Cascades about a century ago. So they were competitors for trap lines. Um, they got into people's cabins and they were, they were extirpated. So um, they recolonized on their own from Canada. Thank you, Canada. <laughs> Yet again. <laughs> um, and uh, 30 to 40 is not to the carrying capacity of our habitat. But we don't have a real, um, we've only done monitoring in a certain section of the Cascades. And it's only citizen science that's monitored around I-90. So we actually are just at like basic questions. There could be more wolverine, we don't know. Um, certainly there could be more than the ones that we know of now. But how many is too variable? Like s maybe three wolverine within 350 square miles or 17, depending on where you look across the globe. So it's so variable that we just, we don't know. Uh, so. I actually was out with a crew that found Wolverine Den last year skiing, so for everyone in the audience who thinks this is far-fetched, this can totally happen to you. <laughs> and keep your eyes open. Um, I just wanted if you could talk a little bit about why they require such deep snowpack and what it is about their life history and their life cycle that they really need these deep snow events. Yeah, so it's the females <laughs> that require so much snow. Males too, but mostly to den. Um, natal dens are buried. I've read of a 30-foot subnivian natal den, like 30 feet, like multiple meters down and out. Uh, so, so wolverines uh, mate in the summer. They have delayed implantation. And if there's enough resources through the winter, then females will give birth. And usually it's in February. So when they do that, they dig these extensive... Um, dens in the snow. And so the one thought is thermoregulation, and then another is protection from predators. And they keep those dens until the kits are weaned, and that's usually in April or May. So that's why the bioclimatic envelope is looking at persistent spring snowpack until, I think it's May 15th, middle of May. And they also cache food. This is called the refrigeration hypothesis. So they put pieces of carrion all across their range by glaciers or you know, snow fields, and then they'll come back in the summer or in the lean times to retrieve that food. Great, final question. I think it's in the, <clears throat> that book, The Wolverine Way, you mentioned. Um, the author describes uh, a process of keeping the wolverine calm once it's been trapped in that little log cabin. And he said that the field biologist brought a wind-up radio and tuned into some corny country Canadian radio station. <laughs> because if you don't keep the, the wolverine calm, they freak out and they injure themselves trying to escape from that cabin. So is that true? And if so, what's the radio station that you guys use? <laughs> we prefer KEXP. There's something about the white noise in the bed. No, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. I don't think there has been any um, music played at the traps, um, no, it's, but, so I've actually only gone um, to r release one animal, and we're like, okay, coming up to the trap, <laughs> who's gonna be in there? And the person with me who had been on the survey for a long time said, it's not a wolverine, I'm like, how do you know that? It could be, it could be. <laughs> She's like, it's not growling. <laughs> so um, yeah, so they are tenacious, they hate being trapped. I mean, hate is an emo I don't know if they hate it or not, but they really get uh, audible, loud when they're trapped. <laughs> and they will chew through those traps to get out. So that's why they're made of such large rounds of wood, because they will chew right through an eight inch diameter log if you leave them there for too long. Um, and I don't know, I think just a lot of drugs is how you really handle <laughs> 
the tenacity of a wolverine when you're putting a collar on one. 